I'm going to uh, Europe for a couple of critical conferences where I'll be representing, um, in a sense, the vision that large organizations will be leveraging psychedelics in the pursuit of um, not just mental health in the workplace, but productivity, which I know is a, a bit of a stretch for a number of individuals in the traditional world to believe. But uh, I absolutely believe within five years, uh, it will be more common than it is in a microcosm of, say, for instance, the, uh, the ecosystem of startup organizations and unicorns in the Bay Area. Keith Ferrazzi, I just want to welcome you to the virtual summit, um, Psychedelics and the New Coaching Paradigm. It's an honor to have you here. And Keith, where I want to start is just as a brief intro of, of who you are um, as an opener for the, the, the video for the summit. All right, Paul, thank you very much. And, and I, I appreciate being here today. Um, <clears throat> I'm Keith Ferrazzi. I am an executive coach of teams. Um, as distinct from where a lot of individuals have built a beautiful practice around coaching specific individuals, what I've been studying is the interdependency of a group of individuals and how they get their greatest performance. Um, I created a word for it. Uh, I call it co-elevation. It's a group that significantly collaborates to get better outcomes, a group committed to a shared mission, but a group that's, that's committed to each other's success as well lifting each other up. And that doesn't always mean um, positivity. It could also mean positive critique. It could also mean sharpening the, the ideas on wrestling healthy ways with, uh, with effective conflict within an organization. Um, and we've been blessed with the opportunity to help uh, accelerate uh, the success and turn around many, many organizations that, that we all know very well. Um, and that's been our practice for over 20 years. Beautiful. And so then the next part that I want to open up is just what was your introduction into the world of coaching? Why have you committed so much of your time to mastering this craft? Actually, before we go there, I think it, I probably missed the opportunity to weave in the plant medicine component. Um, Let's do that. Yeah. So um, the, um, let me just think how you want to go there. Um, on a personal basis, I've always been a seeker. Um, I think that probably is, is born from uh, a great deal of childhood trauma and insecurity. And the good news is, even though I hadn't been uh, awoken, um, I, was, <clears throat> I recognized enough that I needed to, uh, to, to doggedly um, move in the direction of the pursuit. And I remember in the earliest days of my life, um, pursuing... Uh, coaching, in a sense, from um, an Anglican priest, uh, not the priest of my, of my family, but an Anglican priest that I felt psychologically safe sharing with. Um, I remember going to therapy at, uh, at Yale University when nobody did. Uh, only, only those who would hit a serious wall would consider such an activity. But of course, throughout my years, um, anything from um, Tony Robbins, Deepak Chopra, Insight Seminars, um, Warner Earhart, all of these individuals not only became pursuits of mine, but friends. Um, and then <clears throat> when I had a significant breakup with my last partner, I, I awakened to the idea that I needed something deeper. And by the way, I had found some pretty deep solutions in plant medicine. I'm sorry, in, uh, in meditation before I found plant medicine, um, Vipassana, 10 day sits of, uh, of meditation, uh, 10 days of silence, which is an extraordinary opportunity if anybody hasn't done a Vipassana sit. Um, but I found my way into plant medicine first with psilocybin and, uh, and then with ayahuasca. And that became game changing for me. Um, not that any of the other pursuits, uh, subsided, but the, but this provided a wormhole into a place in myself that I saw and experienced real healing and real growth and real opportunity. Um, I have been committed for quite some time to the power of this medicine um, in pursuit of general mental well-being, 
um, certainly in, in terms of mental health, but I mean general mental well-being. And I sat on a panel not long ago where I am absolutely committed. In fact, I'm going to uh, Europe for a couple of critical conferences, Davos and uh, uh, the DLD conference, where I'll be representing, um, in a sense, the vision that large organizations will be leveraging psychedelics, um, whether that be microdosing or journeying in the pursuit of um, not just mental health in the workplace, but productivity, which I know is a, a bit of a stretch for a number of individuals in the traditional world to believe. But uh, I absolutely believe within five years, uh, it will be more common than it is in a microcosm of, say, for instance, the, uh, the ecosystem of startup organizations and unicorns in the Bay Area. And that's something that I want to end on because I think that that I'm so glad you brought that up. I, I didn't know if that would be a, an appropriate topic for us, but it feels sure. like even with the, you know, with co elevation and radical adaptability, those two those two frames that you've created, the the benefits of plant medicine map really well on to how they can help teams with uh, yeah. a, adopting those two yeah, those that, two frames. That's actually a really good idea. Let me go through that a little bit with you. Um, mm -hmm. So starting, I don't have the book here. Let me see. Never Eat Alone? Yeah, starting with Never Eat Alone. The number one New York Times bestseller? Is that the, that's the one? That's I've how I a, found I've, out about you. I've, I've had a couple. You've had a just couple. Just kidding. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the date of publication. I always forget. I think it's 2006. Um, I don't see it right now. 2005. 2005. Um, yeah. So... When, when this book was published first, uh, it became an awakening in, in business, in the world of business, to what I come to call the relational sciences. Um, how do individuals relate with each other? Of course, people bought it because it's the number one uh, best-selling uh, book around networking. But so, you know, if you're a coach, you have to read Never Eat Alone. And it's not because I get royalties. It's because it is the, it's the single reservoir of, of information for you to build your practice through more authentic and deep relationships. So many people feel that networking is this contrived, manipulative thing you do when you want to get things out of people, when in reality, it's the thing that you do in walking through the world, um, being of service, being of service. Um, now, it's very interesting because, and I'll, I'll give you a little cheat to what I've learned about Never Eat Alone in, uh, in over, you know, 2005, uh, you know, approaching a dozen years, a, a couple dozen years at some point soon. Um, what, I, what I found was that it, it can be exhausting. Um, but the good news about the book, it's written in a way that you can just eat like popcorn, little practices that will significantly help you. You don't have to do it all, um, but it's a wonderful uh, architecture for you to consider the journey, depending upon the degree to which you want to build your practice and have an impact in the world and have financial security. Um, those practices have given me a lifetime of financial security, and it's given me a lifetime of success personally. Um, so for that basic reason, I, I, I highly encourage you. But the degree to which you pursue it is really a personal choice. And coming out of the pandemic, I feel that many of us um, have been laid a table to make some very powerful personal choices. How much is enough? Uh, how much do we want to do? We had a beautiful, um, while tragic, reboot um, for each of us in ourselves. And so I'm not going to, you know, if I were to read that book today as who I am today, I'd be exhausted. Uh, by the way, I happen to be an introvert, and but I'm a learned extrovert because if I hadn't been a learned extrovert, I wouldn't have gotten out of poverty as a young child. Um, I had to learn that relationships were the, were the portal, right, to opportunity in my life, um, which was absolutely true and documented in the book. But the little wormhole that I'll give you is that you wake up today and you don't have to build networks as voraciously as I once thought. Today, you can build communities. Today, you can build communities. And Paul, it's exactly what you're doing here, right? You know, you haven't 
um, chosen to deepen one-on-one relationships with hundreds of individuals. You probably have that as well, but you're, you're creating a community that you're hosting. And by virtue of creating a community that you're hosting, your brand elevates and you serve. And so that beautiful ecosystem of creating community is really a, a, a shortcut to the traditional, I've got to run around being a great networker. Um, so I wanted to just sort of leap forward almost 20 years. And, and that's a great deal of what we learned. And it's now how I write books, actually. It's now how I write books. It's how I write books and it's how I um, think about things. If I have an idea, I now begin, the I, first thing I find is a partner around the idea. And then I start bantering with the partner. And then, be, then I start convening other people who care about the idea, which become a community. And we collectively work on sharing best practices, which ultimately can become articles and books, right? So ideas um, are communities. And so, you know, and I think you've, you've done this as well, Paul, if I'm not mistaken, you're working on a book on this subject, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that model is a very elegant model for all of us to use, uh, you know, moving from ideas to community to, um, to published work and to, and to collective commerce um, where people can, can work together um, and, and, uh, and co-elevate. So that was never eat alone. Um, the next body of research that I, that I did was a body of research called Who's Got Your Back? And it was, it was, um, it was about eight years. Um, I don't, I'm not going to force anybody to watch me look at the next pub date. I forget these things. Um, it was about eight years of research looking at the power of small groups to transform each other's lives. And I believe very strongly in peer-to-peer coaching. Very strongly. In a sense, it's what I'm bringing to teams that I'm coaching. I'm bringing a, an awakening that these teams are coaches of each other, even though they don't think of themselves as that. But I bring that into the group. But it's also, um, we've all seen it in the power of AA, um, in, in small groups of individuals committed to each other's sobriety, uh, Weight Watchers uh, committed to health and well-being, or what's now called WW. I was just with my friend Mindy Grossman, who really has worked to transform that organization. But even all along, that that group had a statistically significant better weight loss than other organizations like it um, because of the peer-to-peer support. So I started realizing that networks um, could, if with the intention of deep transformation. So think about the first book about networking. Second book about how networks, and I, and I really, I, I love that book. Who's Got Your Back is one of my favorite books, and particularly for those of you out there who are practitioners. I'd very much say that that book is an important book because I document the methodology that I extracted from AA and other, other intimate support groups. And I created a mechanism. I call them lifeline groups at the time, lifeline groups. What does it mean to have a group of people? So if you wanted to commune or convene a group of individuals committed to each other's success as a community leader, as a, as a peer to peer coach, I think, you know, I think Paul, that uh, I would highly recommend all of your people to become proficient at leading peer to peer coaching groups. I think it would be a powerful practice for all of them to have. And the methodology for that, by the way, is in who's got your back. Very detailed. What do you do at the beginning of the meetings? How do you run the meetings, et cetera? All documented very proficiently in that book. You're about to say something, Paul? Well, I'm just thinking, how does this map onto psychedelics, right? Oftentimes after we have these psychedelic experiences, we host integration circles, right? Like at One Heart Journeys, when we went, we would would work with ayahuasca and the next morning we would come and support one another. And this phrase peer to peer coaching has often come up about even the, the coaches that we're training where we're really training them in, in peer to peer coaching, um, where they're, they're in there, they're in it with you. And oftentimes with psychedelics, there's a lot of difficult and challenging stuff that comes up and this, this sense of peer to peer coaching and feeling like someone's got your back when you're going and you're, and you're going with courage into some of your darkest, darkest well, parts is, is so helpful. It is that lifeline, like you said. And I also want to, I want us to realize that I think so much of, I think plant medicine and psychedelics have two different um, awakenings, right? This is now not through science or study. This is just through my own personal experience. Um, there's, a, there's a shift of self, no question. 
you're going through difficult things. But um, I think the biggest shift, to be honest, is a shift with other. Right? You're, you're sitting there, you know, I'm in a journey and I'm envisioning my relationships with the people in my workplace and I'm seeing how I need to be a better leader or I'm envisioning my relationships as a child and I'm, and I'm empathizing with my parents in ways that I hadn't before. Um, oddly enough, some of the most powerful awakenings that I get in psychedelic journeys are, are awakenings of other. I mean, we think about it. It's, it's, it's interesting how that we, our language internalize them as individual awakenings about me, but they're not. They're about us. And the one thing that I feel that psychedelics do is it creates a collectivism. It just, it literally plugs you in to the, the, um, uh, to the network. You know, I love the fantastic fungi movie where right now I'm just envisioning the network of psilocybin and mushroom tentacles throughout the planet, right? It, it, it just plugs you in. Now, I don't want to get too universalist, nor uh, I, I'm not a particularly woo-woo guy, believe it or not. I'm a very, I mean, it's as, as much as, you know, I'm, you know, anyway, I, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a pragmatist. You know, the, the idea of going to, different planes of the universe, the idea of, 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 you know, experiencing interstellar universal travel, etc. cetera. Um, even the idea of seeing God um, to me, I mean, I, I happen to be a Christian, but to me, what I see this medicine doing is that it totally, you know, relieves the ego, which protects me and helps me, reconnect with us and and it, you know and whether it's specific experiences or in general um and therefore to me the the processing should be in and us because when we come out of therapy i'm sorry when we come out of a of a plant medicine journey a, th- a plant medicine therapy i feel like or or psychedelic therapy um i feel like the um, the, the immediate connection to the people around us is our first practice ground for application for what we just went through. Because it's one thing to be disassociative. I mean, you can be in that experience and you can reprogram, as my significant other did, uh, he reprogrammed his connection to his mother during a journey, which was a powerful awakening, truly. Just then he was able to get on the phone with her and have a wholly different relationship in, a, in, in short order. Um, but I feel like that kind of reprogramming uh, is cut short if we only act on the individuals in our journeys. Why not the individuals who journeyed with us, which is, a, is the, probably the safest interconnected group because they just had a similar vulnerable experience. So again, you're right. The um, the peer-to-peer coaching, the integration circles, I think, of course, is a critical element of the of the journey. So the next book um, really applied all of this philosophy, both of <clears throat> working in net, well, networking and turned that into how do you work in networks. The book is called Leading Without Authority. Um, and that and book- it, it's, by your Winnie, it's by your Winnie the Pooh thing over, right your, over, yeah. over, your, over your right- over your right shoulder there, yeah. Yeah, by the way, the, the book that is not not mine, but I highly recommend it to everybody, is The Tao of Pooh. The I Tao, know, of, the Tao book, of Pooh, the, I love that. Yeah. Taoism as expressed through Winnie the Pooh. Um, I think it's one, you know, Winnie the Pooh is one of the most great spiritual characters, um, God's gift to society. Um, so, um, you know, Leading without authority started to apply the models of peer to peer to how we work together in the workplace. Very important book for you to have your clients read um, if they're in a workplace. If they're in a workplace or if they have a mission they're trying to achieve, inevitably um, you're trying to achieve things by leveraging other people. So, Never Eat Alone opens up relationship for opportunity who's got your back 
con convenes a small group of people deeply committed to each other. Leading without authority takes those two principles and brings it to leadership. How do you lead in loose networks, which is what we inevitably are working with? Um, and that, a great book to give your clients to, to read because um, they've got to navigate and get out of There's a whole section in that book around victimization and, 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 and abdicating personal responsibility because people aren't playing in the way you want them to play. Um, which happens all the time in business to many people's detriment. Um, <clears throat> then, then the next book um, was the book that, that we originally came on here to talk about, but um, I wanted to give people a little bit of a runway to the intellectual property because if they're just catching up on this journey now, um, there's some work to do. But the most recent book is called Competing in the New World of Work, where we took a very rigorous research approach on how to leap forward 20 years coming out of the pandemic, or at least 10, um, and use the pandemic as a reboot for organizational and business, and, and, and to a great extent, personal success. And there's really some four fundamental frameworks. How do we, how do we live with greater foresight? How do we uh, live in a more adaptable fashion? How do we live with a greater degree of collaboration and inclusion, particularly in a hybrid world where you have unending opportunity to include people in, 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 in thinking and, uh, and ideation and decision-making. And then finally, how do we do all of that with great resilience, which is where I, I partnered with Headspace uh, and uh, WW Weight Watchers <clears throat> um, and, uh, uh, and many of the psychedelic companies because I was heavily invested during the pandemic in the psychedelic space out of personal commitment to the space. Um, you know, I think I probably went 20% of my net worth into the psychedelic space because I believed wow. in it that much and still do. I mean, my returns haven't been as, haven't been stellar as we know where the market is, but I don't care. Um, this is, this is so critical to bring this, um, to bring this source to, and this medicine to people. So that's been the journey. Um, working on a couple more books right now, but you know, we'll, we'll talk about that in a year. So let's, let's get into some of these, these phrases that have, that have come up, you know, in leading without authority, you mentioned the phrase co-elevation. You've, you've talked about it, you kind of mentioned it briefly here, but I'd love if you could just expound on what is yeah. co-elevation. And I remember when we were on our, our one heart journey together a few years ago, you were getting ready to publish leading without authority. And I, I think you actually pushed back the publication date. Um, because of those ayahuasca journeys that you went through. So I'd just love to hear a little reflection from you on how has ayahuasca, how have plant medicines helped to further inform your own philosophy around co-elevation and the way that you coach um, organizational teams? Yeah, thank you. So the, the methodologies that we've adopted so far are co-elevation plus radical adaptability. And those two frameworks together make up how an organization, a system, a team, should uh, work in today's very volatile world. Um, Co-elevation basic principle is, it's a deep commitment to eight fundamental um, belief systems and eight fundamental behaviors among a group of people, uh, foremost of which is full transparency and candor. Um, a team has to be able to tell each other the truth. A group of individuals have to be able to push each other collaborate, wrestle ideas. Now that, that is daunting to many relationships. We have too much conflict avoidance in this world, too much scarcity of relationships and therefore fear of people having transparency. Um, one of the things as a coach I'm constantly doing is encouraging people to be uh, courageous, but courage isn't as easy to muster. One of the tactics that I have when I'm coaching is to encourage people to be high integrity. High integrity. You can tell somebody to be courageous, but many people don't think they're courageous. Um, <clears throat> most of us think we're in high, in we're reasonable integrity. But if you let people know that they're they're holding back tr back truth to another individual, lacks in integrity, then they'll begin to think differently about it. It'll put a higher threshold because I think it's true. I think um, you know. A dear friend of mine was grappling with whether to tell her uh, her her boyfriend um, 
that she was struggling with wanting to have children. The boyfriend definitely wanted to have children. She didn't want to have children. The relationship was going fine. They kept talking about it passively. They're not even married yet. But, you know, I, I, I just said to her, I said, listen, you're, you're a high integrity individual and you're lacking integrity by not sharing this. Um, in the same regard, you know, the same individual was, was, was really protecting her heart. She was very concerned about um, overstretching and being really hurt. And she wasn't willing to even call this individual her boyfriend publicly. And she certainly wasn't willing to state or, or, or profess her, her outward love for this individual. They were having a great relationship, she would say. And again, I just told her she was out of integrity. You know, everything about the relationship showed that that was her boyfriend. Everything about the relationship showed that she was in love. And she was out of integrity, right, by not being willing to give that gift to, uh, to her partner. Now, if I had just said, be courageous, right? I mean, imagine how that lands on somebody. Be courageous. I, you know, you and I have probably coached hundreds and hundreds of people who lacked courage and stayed out of courage for a very long time. But I find that when you, when you cloak it, and what is, what is integrity? It's just, it's embracing truth, right? And so if you get people to really understand that they're out of integrity, um, I think they shift quicker. Um, it's a leverage tool. Anyway, um, so I was, what I was talking about was the integrity of, of candor. And the, other, the underpinning of co-elevation, though, is a strong relationship, a real care for people. And you can get away with a lot of candor if people know that you love them, if they, you care for them, if you're committed to them. And so the relational sciences really start with productivity at the top candor, collaboration, accountability, holding each other accountable. But the permission for that comes in building the relationship. The formula is, you know, generosity and, and commitment, right? Generosity and care give you the permission for the candor, uh, the collaboration, the accountability. Um, so that's co-elevation. And then we have a whole set of practices that we teach in Leading Without Authority and how you do and bring that co-elevation to a relationship. Um, how do you earn that right? How do you bring that candor, et cetera? Uh, what words do you use? But then you move over to radical adaptability. And radical adaptability means that, you know, we're, if we just stay on a momentum of the past, which in the world of work, we've been doing so for decades and it hasn't been working. I mean, People talk about the future of work as, it's, as if it's upon us, but we've been having bullshit conferences on it for 20 years. Um, and it's now an opportunity to create um, inflection points for us in this big gap. But we should be doing that constantly. What we learned in the pandemic was that it was a massive reboot. It was a massive inflection point. And I'm even seeing organizations not leveraging that inflection point, going back to work which is why I created the foundation, go forward to work, not go back to work. How do you go forward to work? Um, yeah, so that's those two things. And, and that really, as I mentioned earlier around radical adaptability, that's around creating a mechanism in your life where you're constantly getting inputs. So you know, you have foresight so that you know how to adapt your strategies so that you can then be agile, right? And a big part of that is to be inclusive inclusion, collaboration, insights from multiple people give you that, that incremental foresight. So all of us, I, you know, even when I'm talking to, to real estate agents, do you have that team, that posse, that set of individuals in your ecosystem, in your space that are constantly giving you inputs of what's happening and what's changing. And, and again, Paul, I, you know, I, I celebrate you because you're doing that with this community. This is a posse which if you, if you allow this group to have its collective insights, not just receiving it broadcast from people like me, but like one of the things that I would ask you to do in the upcoming session would be send people in. How many people do you think might be there? 
you know, hundreds, thousands. I don't know. What's your, what's your expectation? Yeah, about 2,000 is what we're expecting. I would highly recommend that you provide an exercise for them where you snap your fingers, put everybody into a breakout room. Tony Robbins knows how to do it in, with his technology. He uses Zoom. I don't know what you'll be using. But put everybody into a breakout room and um, open a Google Doc or a Google Form and have that group submit to you what are the most important questions we as a community need to answer. Let's collect that information. Let's assess that information. And then let's publish that information back to them. And then we could start organizing subgroups around question ag aggregated sections of questions, right? And start cracking the code of those together. That's radical adaptability, right? How do we constantly use the community to, to pivot and change our direction and fulfill and co-create together? Um, it's a very simple idea, but it's a very powerful one. I'm getting organizations to crowdsource that kind of insight within their entire company and external ecosystem. And these are major organizations like Fortune 50 companies. These, these aren't just startups necessarily, right? We have, we have barbells in a sense in terms of where we work. We work with the Fortune 100, 500, and then we work with unicorns. And then I work with, um, we have a psychedelic group that works with psychedelic startups just because we believe in that practice and we invest in uh, and work in that space. So Keith, let's spend the last, we have about 10 minutes left or so. And I, I really want to get your insight on what you had sort of dropped a note about what you were going to speak at Davos uh, in, in, in May about, which is kind of your, you, you've, been, you've been really a pioneer in the future of work, which is now becoming the present of work, uh, like yeah. was mentioned in competing in the new world of work. And you've also now been doing plant medicine for many years. And, you know, when I think of fortune 50 companies and exec teams, a lot of people are very skeptical about would they actually be interested in, in, in these sorts of tools. And I get the sense that you're saying they will increasingly. So, and so I'd love to just well, hear they you, are. you and they are, they are, um, they are. I mean, what first step is a personal journey, right? I mean, by, by me, Having done the work, I can walk the planet and in my conversations with my clients, I can speak about the journey I've had for myself. So, you know, that testimonial could at least it's interesting, you know, is my, I would say that there's there's more a, a full lack of understanding or even awareness of this space than there is objections to it. I mean, there, one, once I mention plant medicine, ayahuasca, psilocybin, I get more blank stares than I get anything else. Just literally no clue what it is. Um, you know, you and I live in this echo chamber, right, of being on the coasts and understanding what this medicine can do for people. And clearly in the worlds that we both live in and that all of us live in, we think that everybody understands this or at least have read some New York Times article or some pollen book or something. But no, they haven't, right? So part of it is just being uh, vocal about your healing. That's it. And, you know, I, I, I think I've had this conversation with Ronan Levy um, about the use of the word plant medicine versus psychedelic. And I know plant medicine is only a small subset. And I've also done, I've, I've gone to field trip and I've done, uh, you know, intramuscular ketamine therapy. I've done MDMA therapy. So I definitely see, and I'm a very strong advocate for, um, for, for journeys beyond plant medicine, but I tend to feel like um, if I, that I can get people opened and awakened to, uh, to nature-based plant medicine first, it seems a smoother entry. Now, look, I mean, it's interesting because... You know, some people still think of them as drugs. You know, my key is to not have them not leverage, not use that term unless they're going to use drug just like they would use SSRIs or a drug, right? Or, you know, or, or aspen or, um, you know, erythromycin is, is a drug. Um, I want to get them to equate the fact that if a friend of yours was suffering from um, a mental uh, challenge, mental, men mental illness, mental disability, that you wouldn't 
forbid them from getting medicine from a doctor. Well, we're, we're, we're just introducing a new set of medicines, a new class of medicines. Um, anyway, with that in mind, what I've gone on record as saying is uh, I see the path and I've pursued this with heads of HR where there will be um, at first non-insurance supported um, psychedelic therapy and work that will be supported by corporations. Um, so before there may be insurance reimbursement, there'll be self-paid reimbursement for this type of work. I see that happening within five years. Um, it's already happening, as you know, with Bronner did, did the work where he actually created a great system, but it's going to happen more frequently. And once that starts to happen, the ability for insurers to catch up to that uh, won't be far behind. But, and again, for me, it's not only, you know, I think just like my friend Sanjay Gupta did for cannabis, he started with CBD for childhood epilepsy, right? He, he, he made the world aware that there's a little girl having epileptic seizures, which is, which is cured by, um, uh, I think it was called, was it Charlotte's web? I forget the name mm -hmm. of the yep, Stanley Charles brothers, Charles. Um, Charlotte's web. Um, and that was cured by an innocuous substance that isn't even psychoactive, right? And and then all of a sudden that was a tipping point, and then you started seeing medicinal um, marijuana. And anyway, the story is well known for everybody here. But we'll be going through that same journey, that same pilgrimage uh, in the psychedelic space. And everybody here, I'm sure, believes and knows that to be true. But I see it being a productivity lifter. When I say a productivity lifter, I don't mean getting more out of people. But yes, I do. I mean. The in same thing, you go back to the beginning of our conversation and how the awakening and otherness, I'm coaching a team right now. It's a very well-known team with a very well-known CEO. And um, he, um, uh, it's very clear, and there's a particular individual on this team that is, I can tell, I mean, um, he, she, I won't even go into that detail as to uh, you know, who this individual is, but this individual is really suffering and, and I can see their behaviors and their acting out really pulling the team down and the person's likely to have, you know, a, a job loss ahead of them. Um, and it's a shame because, you know, he, she is um, uh, an incredibly, you know, a uh, capable, smart individual who I could, you know, and I literally said to the CEO, um, because it's a CEO who has also done medicine personally. I said to the CEO, I said, I got it. Just, I wish we could get, you know, he, she to do an ayahuasca journey. Um, you know, I just wish we could get this individual to do a journey because that's the kind of massive chiropractic investment adjustment that we need for her. Him. Um, so anyway, and we both sort of, you know, we weren't laughing about it, right? We, this wasn't sure. some joke. This was, this is what we really need to get this individual, uh, you know, adjusted. I, I do. I, I think of these medicines as a chiropractic adjustment to, to mental well-being. And so final question before we wrap up, you know, you were kind of hinting at this before, but just at the intersection of psychedelics and leadership, you know, you've mentioned productivity, but you've also talked about your own path and leading with vulnerability and talking about your own experiences with this. You know, when we're talking about leadership performance, why is it that you think plant medicines are such powerful tools to help develop those soft skills that are so central to efficacious leadership? Well, you know, you and the people here know more about the science as to why this happens. And, you know, we can all, you know, I was with, um, was with Paul Stamets last week, and I've heard his presentation so many times about what it does and how it works. Um, the, uh, but, but what's important is to recognize that work is interrelated. Work isn't an individual. It just isn't. And what these medicines do is they, they open up the other, the otherness, the us. They make the us effective. They make the us less scared, less reactive. Um, and it gives us a degree of potential in relationships that we wouldn't have had otherwise. 
And so that's to me why this is such important medicine. Because, you know, even today it's, you know, and this is why I started the conversation. You know, everybody talks about leadership competencies. I talk about team competencies. All of my work is about team and how teams effectively work interdependently together. Um, that is a whole different study. That is a whole different study than working with the individual. And it's a whole different study than working with the individual and another individual, which is leadership talks so much about how you manage a person or lead a person. And it's how do you get a person to interrelate with others better? That's leadership. It's, it's leading teams, not just leading individuals. With a, with a core common purpose, right? And that, and that broader mission that they're reaching yeah. out towards. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Well, well Paul, Keith, thank you. You are welcome. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for um, you know, showing up and, and, and being present and sharing so much of your wisdom. It's always an honor to sit down with you and, and, and chat about these things. Um, and, you know, for listeners, we've, we've got the full scope of your books in terms of what, what has been written. Any, any last words you want to share before we, before we wrap today? No, I, I think that, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the real key is that the tools have opened up a lot in the last two years in terms of inclusion, collaboration, the technology has changed. And so we've got to make sure that we catch up to that technology in our work behaviors. We, we're running workshops now, um, which by the way, if anybody's interested, reach out to us online and offer up your services if you feel you would be great. If, you're, if you have some specialties in hybrid work tools and hybrid work ways, that's an area we're investing a lot in because the tools have changed the way we work, but you haven't meaning the world hasn't changed the way we worked enough to use the tools to change the way we should work. And so we're spending a lot of time on that right now. Beautiful. Thank you, Keith. Yeah. Paul, thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit the thethirdwave.co where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.